Hi there, and welcome to The Salted Pepper, where we cook for real life, using real food, and we keep it real simple. And today, we are gonna make a super easy and delicious cheesy meatloaf. And we're gonna make it with carrots and potatoes, so it's an all-in-one full meal. So the first thing we need to do is get our glaze going. Now, we're gonna use a glaze on the top of the meatloaf, but we're also gonna use some of the glaze inside. So the first thing I'm gonna put in is six ounces of tomato paste. one tablespoon of apple cider vinegar, or you could use balsamic if you like, that would be great too, one tablespoon of Worcestershire sauce, and we're gonna put in one tablespoon of brown sugar, and then for our spice blend, we have a half a teaspoon of sea salt, a half a teaspoon of dried basil, a half a teaspoon of onion powder, and a half a teaspoon of garlic powder. We're gonna add that in. Get the rest of those out there. There we go. All right, and now let's just mix this up. Oh, it smells so good. All right, okay, that's perfect. So let's just set that to the side because we'll get to that in a minute. And I'm gonna move this stuff out of my way and we're gonna crush up some cheese crackers for our cheesy meatloaf. All right, so what I have here is two cups of cheese crackers, um, which will yield about one cup of crushed cheese crackers. Now, you could substitute these for any kind of cracker you like, but then we're gonna take away some of the cheesiness of this cheesy uh, meatloaf. When I first tested the recipe, I tried it with oatmeal because that's what I usually put in my meatloaf as one of the binders. And I did not like the way it turned out. Under pressure, the oatmeal gets very bloated and it just gave kind of a funny look to the meatloaf. So I wasn't real happy with that. Um, so I played around with some other ideas and I came up with the cheese crackers and it really adds such a wonderful flavor. So to make this easy, now you could use a food processor too. I mean, but I've got this marble rolling pin and I'm just gonna roll right over the bag. They do not have to be super fine. Just flip it over and just give it another roll and I think we're done. Yep. Perfect. So again, they don't have to be super fine, but that's it. That might be a cup. Yeah, it's about a cup, maybe a cup and a quarter. All right, so here I have two pounds of 80-20 ground beef. Now you could use 90-10, 93-7, whatever you like. You can use ground turkey. If you do use ground turkey, though, I would add a little bit more moisture, maybe cut up some mushrooms, which would add moisture, um, maybe add another egg to it, because turkey tends to be a little drier of a meat, so uh, you would want to add a little bit more liquid to that. Okay, so we're just going to dump in our cheese crackers. And then we're gonna dump in our seasonings. Now seasoning meatloaf is extremely important because you're gonna use more seasonings than you would ordinarily think uh, because it needs to incorporate in the meat and give you a flavorful end meatloaf. And if you under season it, it just kind of loses that umph to it and it doesn't taste that delicious. So um, we're gonna add in one teaspoon of garlic powder, two teaspoons of sea salt, one teaspoon of onion powder. Make sure that all gets out there. Two teaspoons of dried basil. One cup of finely diced onion. And that's kind of important. You want your dices to be pretty small. You don't wanna have big chunks of onion in your meatloaf. You want it to be kind of small so that they sort of blend in with the meat a little bit better and two tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce, and one egg. All right, now for the last thing we're gonna add to our meatloaf is half of that glaze that we mixed up in the beginning. So I'm just gonna eyeball this. This is probably about a cup of glaze, so I'm gonna try to put in about a half of a cup. Doesn't have to be exact, but you know, I'm just eyeballing it. Okay, 
Now the rest of that will go on top of the meatloaf at the end. Now I'm going to mix this up just a little bit, but honest to goodness, the best way to do it is with your hands. So after I get some of this incorporated, I'm just going to have to go in with my clean hands and kind of fold it all together. All right, looks like it's time for the hands to work. Okay, now, while I'm mixing this up, I'm gonna turn the Ninja Foodi on, and I'm gonna turn it on the sear, saute, and hit the start button. The reason why I'm doing that is because, you know, meatloaf, if you're dumping in seasonings, whether you're following a recipe or you're winging it like we always do when we're making meatloaf, a little of this, little of that, um, you just don't know how it's gonna taste at the end, do you? You just don't know. And that's one of the things about making meatloaf that's a little frustrating. You can put a lot of time and effort into making up what you think is the perfect meatloaf mix, but then, you know, it's out of the oven or out of the Ninja Foodi and it like is so bland. So after we mix this up, we're gonna taste it. Now, of course you can't taste raw hamburger. Well, I guess you can, because people do, um, but I don't, <laughs> I don't like it. So um, once we mix this up, we're gonna make just a little teeny tiny patty. Throw it in the Ninja Foodi, let it saute up, and we're gonna give it a taste for seasonings. And what that's gonna allow us to do is add what we need um, to this mix to have a wonderful meatloaf at the end. You can do that as many times as you like. I mean, sometimes when I've made meatloaf, I've had to test it like three or four times just to see if the seasonings are correct. Just a little bit at a time now or you'll, you'll use all your ground beef in your testing. Oh, this is smelling so good. Now you want it to be well incorporated, but you don't want to overwork it either because that can lead to a very dense uh, meatloaf, and that's not what we're looking for. That looks beautiful. All right, I think we're about there. So let me just take a tiny bit, and I mean a tiny bit. So like maybe a teaspoon. I'm gonna pat it down because I want it to cook really fast. And I'm just gonna throw it right in the center, I don't need to add any olive oil because this is an 80-20 mix, but if you're using turkey or a leaner blend, you might wanna add in a little bit of olive oil just to get that um, starting to, to sear without burning. All right, I'm gonna give my hands a quick wash while that cooks up. We'll give it a taste for seasonings, add what we need, and then we'll get to forming our meatloaf and finish up our meal. All right, so I just flipped this a couple of times and it took, oh gosh, maybe two minutes to cook up. I'm just gonna let it cool a minute here. Now, while this pan is hot, because we sauteed something, you can see this, uh, the dark part here. I'm gonna go ahead and put in the liquid that we're gonna use to pressure cook. That way I don't have to clean out the pot. And this is called deglazing. So I just poured in about half of it and I'm gonna take something that's safe for the non-stick and I'm going to definitely like scrape along the bottom to make sure none of that is stuck. Because what happens um, with the Ninja Foodi when you have something stuck to the bottom like that, you can have plenty of liquid uh, to come under pressure, but what it's doing is it's noticing that something's burning and it just triggers the water notice. And you don't want that because you gotta stop cooking. All right, so I am gonna now turn this off though because I don't want it to continue to to cook because it's going to evaporate and we'd have to add in more water. So I'm gonna turn the Ninja Foodi off and just let it, um, you know, just let it sit until we're ready to put it under pressure. All right, so let's move this over here and let's give it a taste real quick and just see. Oh, wow. Mm, that's perfect. Mm, absolutely perfect. But if you think you need like a little more salt or a little more seasoning, a little more pepper, because I didn't add any pepper. So if you wanted to add some pepper in, that's great too. Mm, but that is really good. Mm. Oh, I can't wait to eat this. One of the challenges can be when making a full meal, you know, the potatoes, the carrots, and the meatloaf, is how in the world do we stack it in the Ninja Foodi? Now, some people have the eight quart, which is a little bit higher. That makes it a little bit easier, um, but I only have the six and a half quart, so this recipe will be fine in the six and a half or the eight quart, um, and it does work, but it takes a little bit of finagling. So the first thing we need to think about is our carrots, our potatoes, and our meatloaf. They're all gonna go under pressure for the same amount of time, so we have to treat them a little bit differently. We're going to base it on the meatloaf because that's the one thing that we have to have come out 
cooked well enough. If the vegetables overcook a little bit, no biggie. But if the meatloaf is undercooked, then you know we've just wasted some time because we got to put it back in, let it come to pressure, and continue to cook it. So what in my testing, what I found was between 30 and 35 minutes was a good amount of time for the meatloaf to be under pressure to completely cook it. But I also found that if you just sort of form it and put it like in the basket, it tends to kind of want to fall apart a little bit. And that's because the during the pressure cooking, it is putting a lot of moisture into that meatloaf and it's expanding it. And it just sort of was falling apart. And I didn't really like that too much. So what I've done is make a little, a little pan at, just out of aluminum foil. Now I did get a meatloaf pan from the dollar store and I poked holes in the bottom of it and I, I was all excited about that, but it only makes a one pound meatloaf. And I know that a lot of you want to be able to cook for four, five, six, even eight people and just one pound just isn't enough. And we all like leftovers. I mean, leftover meatloaf is fantastic. So I wanted to make sure that I was using two pounds of meat to give a good size meatloaf. Okay. So we're just gonna dump this on to our aluminum foil. Set that bowl over there. Now we're gonna form the size of meatloaf that we want. Now, the one thing that you do have to keep in mind when you're doing this is that it has to fit on the rack. We're gonna use the rack. So we wanna make sure we don't go any much over the rack. We want it to really fit on the rack. So I'm gonna just push it in square it up and if you see cracks in your meatloaf go ahead and press them back together and I'm just forming kind of just free forming what I think is a good looking uh, meatloaf so I'm pushing it in Now you also want it to be even in height because you want it to cook all the way through. If you have a really big top to it, that means that there's a lot more to heat up and cook in the center than on the ends and that can cause some problems. So you want a uniform shape of a meatloaf. All right, that looks good. Now let me just grab the rack here and see, is it gonna fit on there? Because if it doesn't fit, then I need to and it's just fitting. So I think just to give me a little more comfort here, I'm gonna push it in a little bit more. It doesn't matter if I make it a little higher, I might have to adjust the time a little bit. So if you had set on 30 minutes and you say, oh, you know what, my meatloaf's kinda high, you might wanna go 35, which I think is what I'm gonna do here is go 35. All right, that looks good. Now, we have to finish it up, of course by adding cheese in there. And so what I have here is two ounces of cubed, and it is about a half by a half, maybe even a quarter by a quarter cube, just small cubes of cheese. And what we're gonna do is take it and push it halfway down into the meatloaf. You don't have to go in any kind of pattern or anything. I'm just gonna finish that up, and then we'll have to close those holes up too. You don't wanna to go too far down or it might leak out of the bottom. And if you don't think you can get them all in, don't use them all. I think I might be able to get one more in. Right there, one more in right there. Might be able to get one more in right there. All right, that looks about enough. I, I don't wanna overdo it because um, each one of these holes can potentially allow the meatloaf to sort of fall apart. So we don't want too many. You don't wanna you know, have like 50 of them, or then you're just baking cheese inside of inside of uh, ground beef and it's not exactly uh, a meatloaf. Okay, 
Let's push it back together. If you see any of the cheese popping out, push it back in and get that meat over top of it again. And some will still find its way to the surface. And you know what, that's fine. It actually adds a nice little flavor when we put the glaze on and air crisp it at the end. I really like it. All right, I'm gonna flip this around just so I can see the other side. Make sure we got everything covered and all the holes are covered. It looks really good here. Okay, now to compress it, I'm gonna pull this up and pull this up and I'm gonna squeeze it together. It does not have to be totally sealed at the top, that's fine, but I want it to be, again, a nice meatloaf. Now we might have gone a little bit too wide, so I'm gonna push it in and I'm just gonna use this to kind of keep it. That looks pretty darn good right there. Now let's see, will it fit on a rack? That's the big test. Yep, perfect. All right, and like I said, it can be open in the top, that's fine. In fact, you don't want it to be totally closed. All right, so the final thing we're gonna do is poke some holes in the bottom of the meatloaf. So I'm just gonna take it off the rack, turn it over, just hold it in my hand. Now don't go all the way through, you'll stab yourself. Now I am using just a little cake tester from Pampered Chef because I just love it and I find all kinds of uses for it. I'm not going real far into the meat or anything. I'm just like really just poking. I'm gonna poke just a few here. That's also gonna allow the steam to get in there and cook this meatloaf. All right, so the meatloaf is done. Now we can set that to the side. Okay, let me real quick wash my hands and then we'll get to working on our vegetables. So the first thing I'm gonna do is get the carrots. I wanna do the potatoes at the very end because this is not a time where I wanna soak the potatoes. I want the starch to be in them, so I'm not gonna peel and cut them until I am absolutely ready to go under pressure so that they don't turn brown. So let's start with our carrots. This is one and a half pounds of carrots and they are pretty wide in diameter. You don't wanna use real skinny carrots because they're gonna overcook. And I have one and a half pounds here that I've already peeled and I've cut in half. You don't wanna slice them, they're gonna overcook, okay? You can't leave them whole necessarily because they don't fit real well, but you do want to uh, keep them in the largest pieces you can. Because remember, 30, 35 minutes is a long pressure cooking time. All right, so let's get another bit of aluminum foil. Now what I found works best for this is to do a few at a time. And that's because you need to strategically place them around the meatloaf and in the pot to be able to get them all in. So if you just do it in one big pouch, it tends to be too bulky and you can't really maneuver and then you tear the, the um, aluminum foil and it's, it just doesn't work out. So I'm just gonna put in probably three, three to four. That looks, no, three. I'm gonna do three at a time because that'll give me a small little pouch I can stick in here and there and make it all work. Okay, now, seasoning. We still wanna season our carrots. You can season them afterwards, but I always start with a little bit of salt. And I mean a little bit, I'm just taking a tiny little pinch of salt, I'm not measuring. And then one of the things that I love to add to carrots is nutmeg, and I like to use freshly grated. Um, it gives me a little bit more control because nutmeg is a pretty powerful spice. This is totally optional. You could put salt, pepper, you could put garlic, you could put whatever you like. I'm not gonna worry about the butter yet because that's not going to stay in the pouch. I'm gonna butter them at the end. I'm just gonna grate just a tiny bit of nutmeg. A little goes a long way, so don't use too much. And then I'm just gonna wrap these in foil packets. This is gonna help, I'm not poking holes in these either because I wanna protect them from the heat as much as possible because I like my carrots um, on the firmer side. If you want your carrots to be really soft, you could poke some holes in here, but I wouldn't recommend just throwing them in un, you know, unwrapped because they are gonna really become mush. I mean, it, it'll be like a carrot puree. Um, and if that's what you want though, that's fine. I mean, of course, if that's what you like, go for it. Do this with three more here. That's a big guy. Just a little salt. A little fresh nutmeg. 
And if you don't want to get fresh nutmeg for this, I totally understand, and you want to use regular, um, you know, ground nutmeg, or you don't want to use it at all, that's fine too. But if you want to use the ground nutmeg, what I would say is that this is not even an eighth of a teaspoon. I mean, it literally is a, just a sprinkle. So very small amount. You can always add more. All right. So I'm just gonna finish doing this with the rest of them, and then we will get to working on our potatoes. Okay, so we're all done with our carrots. Let's start working on our potatoes. I have one and a half pounds of russet potatoes that I'm gonna peel and I'm gonna keep as whole as I can. Now I've gotta think about spacing, so I'm gonna start off with them completely whole. And if I have to cut them in half, I'll cut them in half. Um, but I'm hoping I can keep them whole. Now, what's gonna happen at the end of this is you'll be able to determine if you wanna make like a cheesy, uh, crispy potato at the end or if you wanna mash them up. Um, you know, you can pretty much do anything with the potato at the end that you'd like. I have done it both ways. I've mashed them and I've also done the cheesy. So what I'm gonna do is at the end, I'm gonna see, did I have to cut them in half? If I had to cut them in half to fit, then I might end up mashing them up because they're gonna be a little softer. If they retain their firmness, they need to be cooked a little bit longer. Then I'm gonna put them in the bottom of the pot and I'm gonna throw in a little bit of cream and I'm gonna throw in a little bit of cheese and I'm gonna let them crisp up while I crisp the meatloaf. So really, just be flexible with that at the end. Um, if you have your hopes set totally on mashed potatoes, then I recommend doing them separately so that you get the consistency of the potato that you absolutely want. Because um, this is gonna be a full pot and there are variables that go into pressure cooking. So I really urge you guys to be flexible and do what the end result of the food tells you would be the best application. So if they're super hard, then it's not gonna be a good idea to mash them unless you wanna put it back under pressure for a few more minutes, which is an option as well. All right, so I'm just gonna peel these potatoes. Get out any of those little eyesores. I'll give them a quick rinse as well, just to, uh, just to remove any of the remaining little skin dirt. Even though I've already washed these once, they're still, you know, they just get that little powdery stuff on them. All right, great. All right, so I'm just gonna finish the rest of these and then I'll give them a quick rinse and we'll see if we can fit them in the hole. So we're finished with our potatoes, and as you can see, I had a, quite a few of those eyesores that I had to dig out, but anyway, that happens sometimes. So now what we're gonna do is get everything set up so that we can get it into the Ninja Foodi and start our pressure cooking. And this is where we get like a little bit um, creative. So I'm gonna throw the rack in here, and it is on the low position, because you're gonna need it on the low position. I'm gonna try to see it. Maybe if the meatloaf goes over to the side, I'll have more real estate. I'm gonna put my carrots in and I'm just gonna sort of line them around. One thing to keep in mind when you're doing this is you wanna keep the back part where the vent um, seal, the little red button and stuff is, you wanna really keep that from being overcrowded. That can impede the movement of it and um, it'll give you some problems when you're going under pressure. So I'm just gonna tuck these in wherever I can find a little space. This is where we get creative. Now I'm still gonna wrap these potatoes in foil, and I'm gonna try to do a couple at a time just to kind of save, save foil, but sometimes you have to do just one at a time. All right, I'm trying not to go on the top of the meatloaf too much. What I noticed when I piled it up on top of the meatloaf that it impeded the way that the steam penetrated the meatloaf, and I wasn't really happy with the results at the end. So now it looks like I'm going to be going, I think I can do maybe two more. Actually, you know what? I think I'm going to do one and one. So let me just rip that in half. Because then you have a little bit more wiggle room. And again, keep the back clear. Don't go above where the rack um, lifter is. And one can fit right there. 
And one more, we're gonna make this work. Now, you might wonder why I didn't put, dice up these potatoes. Like, let's say we're gonna mash them up. And why didn't I dice them up and put them on the bottom? Well, I'll tell you, because with 35 minutes of pressure cooking time, I was afraid that the potatoes would start to disintegrate, sit on the bottom, and then create that water notice because the Ninja Foodie would detect that they were burning on the bottom. Um, so I decided that this was gonna be the best way to have everything on top, and that way we are less likely to run into any problems once we set the pressure time. All right, so we get our pressure lid on. Turn it, make sure the valve in the back is to the seal position. One thing I wanna go over real quick because I've had a bunch of people um, having some trouble with this. There is a feel that I can't quite describe when the valve is vented. And um, when it's sealed, it sort of floats in between the vent and the seal, and it can move around. But that is not when it's vented, that is when it is sealed. When you vent it, you're really gonna push it, there's a click and a feel, and the button sort of pops up a little bit. That is when it's vented, and that is how you want it when you're steaming vegetables or anything. When you're steaming, you want that vent open. When you're going under pressure, you want it to be sealed. If you have it sealed when you're trying to steam, you're essentially building pressure in the pot because you're sealing that steam in. So again, vent, there's like a little click, and it raises up a little bit. And then seal just sort of floats. Okay, I hope that helps. All right, so let's get our Ninja Foodie turned on and we're gonna go to the pressure mode. High is what we want and I'm gonna do 35 minutes. And I know somebody <laughs> mentioned this and this is kind of cool. I don't know why I don't do it. I think because I can't see real well from this angle. But if you hold this down, hold this button down, it will jump up in time, I think by like five minutes or so but I can't see real well. So like, I don't know if that's 30 or 35 minutes. That's, that's why I go one at a time because then I can count in my head. But anyway, that was a great tip and I was glad they shared it with me. All right, we're gonna hit start now. This is a pretty full pot, but we only have one cup of chicken stock in the bottom. So I am thinking that that's gonna start to boil, create the steam needed to come under pressure, and I don't think that's gonna take much more than eight minutes, okay? So I think it's gonna be fairly quick. Um, and the reason why I chose chicken broth is because I don't know what I'm gonna do with those potatoes at the end, and I think it's just gonna add in some flavor at the bottom, because I'm gonna, whatever I do with them, I'm dumping those potatoes in the bottom of the pot, and I don't wanna have to clean it out. So I'm gonna use the grease that drips out from the meatloaf and the chicken broth in there, and we're gonna make something with those potatoes at the end. So after the pot comes up to pressure, we're gonna let it cook for 35 minutes under high pressure, and then I'm gonna let it natural release for about 10 minutes. Um, you don't need to go any more than that, really, with this, with the meatloaf. It's gonna be plenty moist enough, so it's not gonna draw out too much moisture. So 10 minutes will be fine, and then we'll release the rest of the pressure, and we'll finish up our meal. All right, so we came up to pressure. It took about, I guess, eight minutes. I didn't actually time it. And then we cooked for 35 minutes under pressure and I did a natural release for 10 minutes and now I'm slowly opening up this pot because, you know, it's always like a little nerve wracking, isn't it? You know, you don't know, is your food gonna be done? And that happens, you know, certainly when you're, especially when you're making a recipe for the first time. All right, so I'm gonna grab some tongs because these are you know, gonna be hot and I'm gonna take out the potatoes here. And this is a carrot bundle. Now I'm not gonna open the carrots because I want them to stay warm and we still have to do a little air frying for this meatloaf to be done. So I'm not gonna open those right now. All right, so we got everything out. I'm just gonna kind of move the meatloaf just a little bit just to get this last little one that's stuck there. All right, perfect. So we've got all of our little bags here. Now, one thing that I love about pressure cooking a meatloaf is the moisture that stays inside. I absolutely love that. But what I don't like is that the outside is also sort of soft, and I don't like that. So I want to air crisp this. Um, so I'm going to open up 
to expose as much as I can. Oh, you can see that nice cheesy gooiness. Oh my gosh, that's so nice. Let some of that steam come out. I might open that up a little bit more. Uh, the first thing I wanna do is let's see, what are we gonna do with these potatoes? Let's see how the, uh, how much they're cooked. Oh, they look pretty good. So what I'm gonna do just to decide what I wanna do, whether I wanna slice them, I'm gonna go right down the middle of one. Wow, you could do anything. You could mash these, you could slice these, uh, you could crisp these, they are perfect. So I'm really excited about that right now. Okay, so now that I've got the foil, I decided I'm gonna take this out because I actually want to expose more than I can safely reach in there and do because the sides of the pot are really hot and I don't wanna burn myself. So I'm gonna take it out, lower the rack here, and move it, and you know, the beauty of foil is you can just take it off. Look at that, oh my gosh. See that cheesiness come out, and then when we air crisp that, some of that's gonna crisp up. Oh, this is gonna be so good. All right, so I'm just gonna take off all the way around. I'm gonna stay on the rack, because uh, moving it to like the crisper basket, number one, it's not necessary. Number two, um, you run the risk of it sort of falling apart because it is very, very moist. Now, we also wanna do a temp. Uh, any kind of ground meat should be at about 165 to be completely finished. Now, if it's a little under, I'm not gonna worry about it because I'm gonna be air crisping it. But I have a feeling that it is not going to be under, and if it is, just by a little tiny bit. We're approaching 160. One sixty-five and still counting, so we are we are good. It is completely cooked, and that is what we want. Okay, so now for the finishing touches here, I'm gonna put the glaze on the meatloaf, and I'm gonna put some cheese crackers on top. I haven't decided if I'm gonna crush them up or if I'm gonna put them on hold, so I'm still debating about that. All right, so let's get the rest of that glaze that we had here, and we're just gonna put it on the top. Oh my. Now, this is an optional step. You don't really have to do that um, if you don't want to. Some people like the glaze and some people don't. This is kind of an old-fashioned meatloaf, the kind that your mom made. All right, that looks good. All right, so now I'm thinking about, you know, how I'm going to how I'm gonna do this. If I wanna put the cheese crackers on top, I don't want it to get too done. I don't want the cheese crackers to burn. And I think what I'm gonna do is wait until the very end and then put them on just at the very end. Let me just trim this off here. All right, that'll be perfect. Okay, so let's make some decisions about the potatoes. We have quite a bit of liquid in here. Um, I would say that's probably a cup and a half to two cups of liquid. Too much probably to mash them. I could empty it up. How about we do some cheesy potatoes? Cause you know how to mash potatoes. So if you wanted to mash them, just sort of empty this out a little bit, um, maybe half of the amount of liquid and then put in um, your potatoes, you know, cube them up and then just hand mash them in the bottom and they're gonna be great. You could also hand mash them, throw some cheese on top and let them air crisp. You can leave them in here and, and do it in a bowl. That would be fine. You could you know whip them up in a bowl. So the possibilities are endless, but I think just to be like a little different than a traditional mashed potato, let's do like a cheesy au gratin style potato. So the first thing I'm gonna do is empty out some of this liquid. And I'm gonna go ahead and lick, put it in here because I might add some more back in. So I'm just gonna go ahead and empty this out. Good. And got to move this to the side for a second. Now let's get our potatoes. So with the potatoes, what I'm going to do is just slice them up and throw them in the bottom here. Okay. 
Okay, that's perfect. Now I'm gonna add in just a little bit, maybe a quarter of a cup of this uh, liquid because you know what, that's got a ton of flavor in it. So we, we wanna use it up and it's got some of the fat. I am gonna add in just a little bit of butter, not too much though. It's so maybe a tablespoon of butter. Go ahead and turn the Ninja Foodi onto the sear saute. Hit the start button. That's just gonna start to heat it up because we are gonna stir this just a little bit to melt the butter, incorporate it. We're gonna add a little salt. You could add pepper. I'm not gonna worry about the pepper because there's gonna be seasonings in there. But if you like uh, pepper, go ahead and add some pepper. I'm just gonna sprinkle about a quarter of a teaspoon of the salt on there. I'm gonna grab some half and half or you could use heavy cream or you could use regular milk, whatever you prefer, and some cheese. And we're gonna finish these potatoes off and then get the rest of it just air crisping in there and we are gonna serve up a delicious dinner. All right, so I'm gonna add about half of a cup. Maybe not even that much, probably a quarter of a cup. Give it a little quick stir around. And then we're gonna put the cheese on top. These would have made a really nice mashed potato too, so you definitely feel free to do that. Wow, they smell so good. All right, so I'm just gonna take, now this is a fine grater, so it's gonna take me a little bit of time, but that's what I had out, and that's what I'm gonna use. The only thing I wanna do is get a nice covering of cheese all over so that it crisps up. This kind of a grater is usually for a harder cheese than this uh, white cheddar, and that's why it's kind of sticking a little bit, but hey, it's gonna work. I'm leaving the Ninja Foodi on because I just wanna kind of reduce that liquid a little bit while we do this. Doesn't matter if there's chunks, it's all gonna melt. So I'm probably gonna add about a cup of cheese to the top. This was not the right tool for the job, guys. <laughs> I should have gotten, taken the time to get my other grater out. In fact, I'm going to do that right now. Oh, that's much better. It's important to right, use the right tool for the job. You could also use pre-shredded cheese if you prefer. But I like to grate my own. I think it, I think it actually adds more flavor, in my opinion. All right, get that over there. Get that over there. Just a little bit more. Oh man, this is gonna be good. All right, that looks good and it smells amazing already. Oh my gosh, this is gonna be so good. All right, set that to the side. Now we're gonna get our meatloaf in right over top. And let's check these carrots. They smell good. So I'm just gonna crisp these up. Now you, this is optional too, you don't need to do that, but I'm just gonna throw these on the rack. Um, just to kind of give them a little air crisp as well. All right, that is wonderful. Now, I'm gonna do the air crisp, and I'm not gonna go on a real high temperature because I don't want to burn that uh, glaze on the top. Okay, so I'm gonna turn the Ninja Foodi on. We're gonna go to the air crisp function. Defaults to 390. I don't wanna do it that high because I don't wanna burn the glaze on the top. So I'm gonna take the temperature down and we're gonna go down to 325. And we're just gonna hit start. I think it does 20 minutes, that's fine. Um, and we'll just keep checking it and everything. So we're almost there. I'm just gonna give this a quick cleanup. Okay, so it's been just about seven minutes 
and I can tell that this has set, that's what I wanted. Now I'm gonna add on my cheese crackers. Now I've debated whether I was gonna crumble them up and make like a little crust that way, but I've just decided, why bother with that? I'm just gonna sit them on top and sort of push them in a little bit. And again, this is totally optional. You could put grated cheese on top if you wanted. My inspiration for this was sort of like, I absolutely love grilled cheese and tomato soup. And, and I like meatloaf. So I kind of wanted to do what to me would resemble a grilled cheese and, and in a meatloaf. Now I'm gonna bump up the heat a little bit. I'm gonna go all the way to 400 because we're just gonna do this for about a minute. You know what I just thought of? I'm gonna use a little brush and brush this on the top of these crackers because that's gonna help set them in and we're just using up some of the flavor and that's gonna even enhance everything even more. So I'm just gonna give these crackers and the top of this meatloaf a quick brush. Now you could pour it on, but then it's gonna get into your potatoes. But I'm gonna give this just a little brush. It's gonna add a little uh, glossiness to it and hopefully soften up those crackers just to sort of bake them in a little bit so that they're not sticking out. Cause some of the glaze it just, it isn't um, on the meatloaf the entire uh, same thickness. All right, that's perfect. Okay, now let's go at 400 for about two to four minutes and I'll just keep checking on it. Okay, so it's been another two minutes and the crackers have browned up some and I think we are done at this point with the meatloaf. Now, next time I think I would crumble them up and spread them over. I think it would be a little more attractive. But anyway, you know, this is a step that I didn't test the recipe for. I just thought it'd be kind of cool to add it in. So the first thing I'm gonna do is get these carrots out of here and then we can get the meatloaf out. Now you could cover these carrots up with some foil and I might do that if I need to go a little bit further with the potatoes on the bottom because we might wanna crisp those up a little bit more. These carrots have really held their texture nicely so I'm, I'm pretty pleased with that for sure. All right, so get some oven mitts, pull this out. Oh, it looks so good. See, did any, oh, we've got to cheese it in there. Now I can see the top of this, um, these potatoes. I like mine a little bit crunchier. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put this lid down while I finish up everything else and just let that keep crisping up. All right, this looks great. Okay, so I'm gonna throw some butter onto the carrots and I'm gonna just lightly cover them in foil just to make sure that they don't cool down while we finish up everything else. Go ahead and season them with a little bit of salt. And how about a little bit of that fresh nutmeg again? Mm -mm -mm. This is going to be delicious. All right, that's enough. Just cover them up. That's perfect. Okay, so now we're gonna get the meatloaf off of the rack and we need to let it rest for a few minutes, but that's fine because we have some time. We're crisping up our potatoes now. So you wanna probably let your meatloaf rest about 10 minutes or so before you cut into it. We can still keep the tin foil on the bottom, that's fine. The rack is cooled down so we can touch that. And just grab it out. And let's go ahead and just put it right in there. That's what I'm gonna serve it on. Beautiful. That really held together. And you can see that the edges now, because of the, we air crisp them, they're really um, brown and they're not like that um, soft looking meatloaf that we started with. And that's why I like to air crisp the meatloaf after pressure cooking it. All right, so we just have about 30 seconds left. Now we did the air crisping for a total of 20 minutes. 
we started out at a lower temperature to do the meatloaf and then we bumped it up and I'm just gonna let the clock run out on the 20 minute timer for the potatoes because they look like they are just perfect and you're not gonna hurt them by keeping this on for a little bit. So just let the clock run out. All right, so let's lift this lid up. Yes, they are perfect. All right. Wow, they look good. Look at that, how pretty. All right, that's great. Okay, so our meatloaf has rusted. We have everything else out. Okay, so let me grab the meatloaf and we will cut into this beauty. Now, I always love the end piece, but for you guys, I'm gonna pull that one out so you can see how beautiful that is. And I'm gonna grab this piece with some cheese crackers. All right. Let's get this out. And we're gonna have that little piece of aluminum foil there on the bottom. Don't forget about that. That's gonna, you're gonna wanna take that off before you serve the slice. All right, so let's get that on the plate there. And the reason why that came apart like that is because it is so super moist inside. Um, but to me, that is worth it because it is so delicious. All right. Let's get some potatoes and some of these carrots. I'm gonna take a little, um, a smaller diameter carrot and a thicker one so I can tell you guys the difference in the texture. All right, now just grab some of these potatoes. Oh, how beautiful. All right, there we go. Look at that, perfect. Okay, so let's give it a taste. Let's start with the carrot here. This is the thinner one. Mmm. Very good. I'm gonna use a little butter on that one, but it's very good. The nutmeg's not overwhelming at all. Mmm. Pretty similar, honestly, in texture. I prefer this one just because it's a little thicker, but they're both really good. All right, let's try the meatloaf. Let's part with the cheese in it. Oh, man. Oh, wow, this is really good. Mmm. This is the best meatloaf I've ever had. The flavors in here, I mean, it's not like super spicy or anything like that. It's not overwhelming. It is a traditional tasting meatloaf. Super well balanced. Let me get a piece with the cheese cracker on there. Mm hmm. It's good, but definitely I would crumble it up next time. It doesn't, it's not really the texture like a really crisp cracker, probably because I brushed it with that grease. Um, it tastes good though. It does give a little bit of texture to the meatloaf, but I think just crumbling it on, it would probably look better and, and taste the same. This potato seems a little hot. I mean, wait a minute. Mm. Really good. Possibly could use a little bit more salt, but other than that, I mean, this is a really tasty. It's super hot too. Mm. 
I love the slight little crunch of the cheese on there. Probably I could have even added a little more cheese. Um, but really, all in all, it is super delicious. So this took probably, with prep time and everything like that, probably about an hour and 20 to an hour and 30 minutes to make a complete meal. But as you know, meatloaf even in the oven takes about an hour. Um, are you saving time? Probably not by using the Ninja Foodi, but what you are doing is creating an absolutely perfectly cooked meatloaf that is moist in the center, but done all the way through, and you're able to crisp the outside. And that's the beauty of the Ninja Foodi, and that's why I love cooking with it. So I hope you give this one a try, and I hope you like the video, and if so, give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet, you can do that right over there. Be sure to check out our Facebook groups. We have Ninja Foodie 101, where we go over the basics of using the Ninja Foodie and share our recipes and our tips and all of our tricks. And we have a lot of fun in that group. And then we also have Ninja Foodie Fresh and Healthy, where we try to cook a little bit healthier with our Ninja Foodie.